Welcome back to Combat Mission and Battle for Normandy for the 14th mission of the Scottish Corridor campaign. This is the last battle in the campaign. There is potentially a bonus battle set in Operation Bluecoat much later. It seems as though that's not part of Operation Epson and the titular Scottish Corridor. I'm going to ignore it. So once again we are commanding the 9th Cameronians defending the village of Granville. Yesterday the weather finally cleared up and German counterattacks were savaged by Allied tactical air power. To avoid this, the enemy are now attempting a night attack. This is again from the west, so the ground incorporates Granville and La Carouge once more. There are some minor differences as a result of simulated battle damage, but nothing major. The big change then is obviously the darkness. It is 0235 and pitch black. Engagements are likely to be at closer ranges, and spotting is going to be primarily by sound until the shooting starts. After that, it's all about muzzle flashes and escalating engagements. The Germans are, according to the briefing, leading with another rocket strike and likely to follow up with tanks and no doubt infantry. The British force is almost the same as the last mission. C and D companies of the Cameronians, plus some of the battalion scouts and six pounders, along with a Vickers machine gun section and three 17 pounders. The Churchills of 9th Royal Tank Regiment have withdrawn for the night, which is a standard practice, but most of them will return at the 10 minute mark. At 50 minutes, the rest of the Churchills will appear, plus a trio of Achilles tank destroyers. The Achilles is a British variant of the M10, replacing the 3-inch gun with the 17-pounder, so these will hopefully be useful against any big cats that appear. There is no artillery support to begin with, but at 10 minutes a mass of it will come online. Two sections of the battalion mortars and a troop each of 25 pounders, 4.5 inch mediums, 6 inch heavies and 7.2 inch heavies. Thankfully I have a few TRPs this time to make it easier to call them in. This sounds like a solid force but there are some very important details. Although it looks like everyone has been resupplied with ammunition, the losses of the last battle have yet to be replaced so some of the units are under strength, particularly the tanks and everyone has been fighting all day, so they're pretty knackered as well. On the plus side, the objectives are very straightforward. 250 victory points for Occupy Objective Fair, that's the Granville Church area, and 150 for Occupy Objective Square, La Chisnay, plus the usual 100 for keeping casualties under 20%. In terms of planning, I'm ultimately somewhat reactive here. My main combat power lies in the artillery and tanks, so the job of the infantry and anti-tank guns starting on the map is to detect, absorb and hopefully fix incoming German forces. Each company has one platoon deployed forward, C company on the right and D company on the left. C company is slightly weaker, having had one platoon all but wiped out clinging onto the firm their smuts in the last mission, so the rest of them are deployed in and around La Chesnay. D Company is set up to defend the area around the church. Having been stung by first term rocket artillery before, I'm not sitting directly on top of the Granville objective, except for one lucky six pounder set up in the graveyard. The plan is to move up and start occupying the buildings after the barrage. I'm also expecting to fight it out at relatively close ranges, so the TRPs are covering the front of each objective and the last one is in the central wheat field where the Germans attacked before. This is not necessarily going to be about destructive artillery this time round. If the enemy is caught on these spots then all the better, but the main intent is to use the artillery to block access to the objectives. I'm down to one FO now and a lot of the artillery assets here are less organic and thus less responsive assets. So complicated and reactive fire missions jumping all over the map are not really on the cards. That doesn't mean that simple and unresponsive artillery can't be effective. As the game kicks off, German rockets start raining down on La Chesnay. For whatever reason, I hadn't anticipated a rocket attack here, so while I've hung back from Granville Centre to avoid the preparatory barrage, C Company has two platoons carrying under this bombardment, and they take losses. Meanwhile, out in front, the two outpost platoons start picking up sound contacts. Tanks lots of tanks, and after a little while, lighter vehicle contacts too, half-tracks or armoured cars. 
There are always more unresolved contacts than solid ones, but by the five minute mark it's clear that there are two significant thrusts closing in on the outposts. This is an obvious concern. Those forward infantry platoons are on their own. If a firefight kicks off, my other units in depth won't be able to support them. Pulling them back might be a good move, but where would they go? 15 platoon on the right has the rocket barrage still falling in behind it, but either platoon is only going to be falling back in a way that compresses the depth of my defense. Bringing the infantry platoons close in on one another so that they can actually mutually support each other in the dark makes for a kind of force density that is very vulnerable to high explosive shells from enemy tanks. So I make the call to hold in place. Each platoon has a peart and a six pounder. With any luck they'll do some damage and hold up the German advance, buying more time for the tanks and artillery to arrive. 15 platoon is first on the menu dug into the orchard between La Petit Mutard and the central wheat field. A single rocket from the barrage drops short, causing seven casualties even as the swarm of sound contacts close into spitting distance. It's the six pounders two ammo bearers that actually fire the first shots, gunning down the German infantryman emerging from the darkness at almost point blank range. A firefight immediately erupts, escalating as more firing creates more targets for both sides. There's not only a whole infantry squad in the middle of the road right in front of the six pounder, but more in support, and something that sounds distressingly like an 88 that smacks the AT gun with a HE shell and knocks it out. It's a Yak Panther. Not good news. There are casualties all around. 15 platoon engaging fleeting infantry targets in the field by Petit Mutard, while four Stugs resolve alongside the Yak Panther. The left side is quiet, but there's a horde of infantry contacts almost on top of the position. This I am at least able to help with. The battalion mortars have come online early, at the 5 minute mark, and via the TRP in the centre field I'm able to quickly bring them in. It's not an accurate mission, but it's intense and it covers a big chunk of the German attack. The mortars can't fail to inflict heavy casualties on the Germans out in the open, but it's already too late for 15 platoon. Within two minutes, they've been completely shattered and they collapse back towards Granville. There are two Stugs in the centre too. Firing at 15 platoon lights one of them up for the six pounder in the graveyard, but while it scores a penetrating hit, the assault gun is able to reverse off into the darkness. Over on the left, it's clear that the same story is teeing up. Having seen how the fight on the other flank panned out, I start collapsing the infantry sections into the firm the chateau where they can at least fight on slightly better terms. The leading German teams are wiped out but only at point blank range and the muzzle flashes for the forward section light them up for a barrage of response fire from the horde of German infantry, half tracks and armoured cars out in front. They're wiped out in short order. The other section outside the compound panics and flees towards Granville leaving the platoon HQ, Piat, 2 inch mortar and remaining section holed up in the farm. Here they give a good account of themselves. It's messy, but they're at least shielded from the massed enemy firepower by the high walls and able to gun down German soldiers trying to storm the buildings or the gate. They even have a stroke of good luck. In the rolling chaos, a Stug rolls right in front of the Piat team to put a bomb into the side and force the crew to bail out. Ultimately, they don't last though. The platoon disintegrates under pressure, making a break for it only to be cut down. That sees both outposts rolled up. I'm down a third of my infantry in exchange for causing some hopefully not insignificant casualties and identifying the German thrusts. It looks like a mix of infantry, stugs and light vehicles punching down each flank, probably focused on each objective. Probably more critically, the fighting at the outposts has highlighted the tactical conditions. The darkness makes mutual support much more difficult and the Germans have an advantage at the sharp end where they can mass overwhelming firepower. Worse, they have plenty of armoured support. There are Stugs and at least one Jagdpanther on each flank. These are both non-turreted casemated vehicles so naturally I want to engage from their flanks. But with the visibility so bad, it's not like I can wait until they're facing the wrong way before popping out to engage them. Increasingly, it looks like the artillery is going to have to do the heavy lifting, and even getting it on time on target and decimating the German infantry means that the anti-tank fight is still up in the air. 
For now though, there's some respite. The same darkness that keeps me from mounting an effective mutually supporting defence in depth is also preventing the Germans from keeping the pressure up. There's a lull while they move on to the next stage. The first Churchills have arrived, the three squadron HQ tanks on the left and 10 troop on the right along with a single survivor from H troop. I actually misidentified these when they first appeared, thinking that the squadron HQ was a standard troop and 8 troop was the HQ tank, so the squadron HQ went off to take up positions behind the buildings on the left and the no doubt confused but quietly relieved 8 troop HQ went to sit next to the two infantry company HQs in the rear to liaise. 8 troop HQ is probably even more relieved when there's a huge explosion over on the left. One of the squadron HQ close support Churchills took a pot shot at an armoured car, missed, but attracted the attention of a Yacht Panther. The Churchill spots it as it also misses its first shot and manages to put a 95mm heat round into the gun mantlet only for it to splatter to no effect. The Yacht Panther doesn't have that problem, punching an 88mm sized hole through the Churchill's turret. The Churchill's ammunition detonates, wiping out the crew. Not great. Over on the right, things aren't great either. Ten troop have occupied the hedgerow behind La Chesnay where they can hopefully cover that objective and I'm committed to calling in my artillery out in front to block the impending German advance. The problem is timing. I've got one FO and I'm using him to control one gigantic fire mission with everything in it bar the mortars. All of the different assets have different calling times with the 25 pounders being the quickest at 5 minutes on a TRP. Calling the barrage in on the La Chesnay reference point, the mass of encroaching Germans aggravatingly stops short just as the first shells come in. I don't have ammunition to burn here. I send out the order to stop and start again a little closer, hoping to catch them on the next push. Over on the left, I'm having a similar experience with the mortars. These I've assigned to one of the scout section HQs, which is set up in one of the buildings where it can see over the gap between the firm, the chateau and the Granville objective. The mortars come in, but it's impossible to tell if they're achieving anything and meanwhile things shift up a gear elsewhere. There's a string of infantry contacts approaching from the central wheat field just at the edge of the radius of the Granville TRP, so I switch the mortars onto them. The swarm on the right is just about leaving the new artillery fire mission area as it kicks off. 25 pounders raining down as the infantry make contact with the defenders. They undoubtedly do some damage, but it's too late for what's left of 14 platoon after the rockets. In the center, I've pushed 9 troops HQ forward, another lone survivor, and it spots German infantry moving up through the orchard on the right. It entirely coincidentally hits and knocks out a half track, but there's another Jagdpanther on overwatch. Firing from the corner of the wheat field, this scores a hit on 9 troop HQ, killing one of the crew. As the Churchill reverses off though, the Yag Panther takes a penetration to its front slope in return. The Achilles have arrived. One of them positioned in the Bacage alongside 10 troop has made the spot and put a 17 pounder AP shot right through the armour. The Yag Panther turns and begins to reverse away while the Achilles reloads. It manages a second shot just before the huge tank destroyer disappears, hitting the muzzle brake. That's got to have disabled the 88. It doesn't look too far off actually going down the barrel into the breach. The Achilles doesn't get away scot-free. A stug in the orchard spots it and inflicts some spalling damage to the turret, but I'll take a damaged Jagdpanther any day. Not that it helps out at La Chesnay that much. The Germans have to be suffering under the artillery. I can't see much of their infantry, though a stug suddenly lights up as it's annihilated by a lucky 25 pounder shell, but it's not stopping them from overrunning the farm. The left is kicking off as well. The contact swarm is now pushing up against the road between the Churchills and the objectives. Again, in daylight this would be suicidal, but at night the Germans are getting away with it. This is obviously a problem. While I have a 17 pounder and two Churchills in position to deal with this, they just can't see anything. So I order one of the scout carrier drivers into a building and get him to start taking pot shots into the general mass of contacts. This provokes the desired reaction. A half-track gunner fires back, cutting him down, but revealing his vehicle. B Squadron's HQ puts a round into it, knocking it out, and a second later the 17-pounder nails not only that one, but an unseen heavy armoured car in front of it. 
The 17 powder suffers rapid retaliation, being knocked out, but the shooting has evidently stung the Germans into action. Infantry contacts light up as they start engaging the Granville objective, while another armoured car plinks a burst of 20mm cannon fire off the front of the squadron HQ's turret. It gets a 95mm shell in return, plus a bonus 17 pounder shot from an Achilles in depth. These light vehicles aren't my main problem though, following up with some brief area fire onto the German infantry, a Stug spots the HQ tank and destroys it, only to be knocked out in return from a keyhole shot across the map. The Yak Panther on the left is also firing, trying to hit my infantry in the objective buildings, revealing its position to the remaining Churchill on the left. Armed with a 75, it manages to make the spot and put two penetrations into the side of the Yak Panther. It's still going, rotating towards the Churchill before disappearing from view, but hopefully it's damaged. And hope is a really big factor here. I simply can't see enough of what's going on to be sure of how things are going. I know I've not stopped the Germans on either flank, but I do know they're taking losses. Over at La Chesnay, it's clear that the objective is completely overrun. The artillery is falling, the Germans are probably having a bad time, but that objective is out of the picture. What I want to do is adjust the artillery over to the Granville objective, which is standing by to be overrun. But because this is a mixed fire mission, the game prevents me from adjusting it until all the assets are firing, so I have to wait for all four batteries to come online before I can switch it. The irony is that I have more active tanks over on the right, still the three Churchills of 10 troops and one of the Achilles. These are fairly reliably taking out anything they actually spot in and around La Chesnay, including a Stummel turned to fire into Granville, but I don't want to risk a counterattack right now with all of the German tank destroyers and assault guns unaccounted for. In any case, La Chesnay is the minor of the two objectives, it's all going to come down to Granville. The Germans start to push, moving their infantry forward along with whatever remaining vehicles they have over on the left. About a minute after they start pushing, I'm finally able to complete that artillery adjustment. Everything starts hailing down on the front left corner of the objective. Again, I can't see much of what's going on, but seeing as though I know there are contacts there, and they haven't started reaching my infantry hold up in the buildings yet, I'm confident the Germans are having a bad time. Or at least their infantry is. It's a lucky shell that finds a stug half track or armoured car, and even with the infantry attacking on that access getting fixed and pummeled, there are other thrusts to deal with. Some German infantry is infiltrating in from the front, the mortars ran out of ammunition a while ago, and although I have infantry dug in into the graveyard now, once again, it's too dark for them to actually spot targets. This gets even more aggravating when German Stugs start joining them, cutting across the fields between Granville and La Chesnay from the centre. They're a pain to get rid of, an enemy mortar took out the six pounder in the graveyard, and there's only one Piat team left on that flank by this point, and it predictably fails to find a Stug to fire at before going down. Another stug breaches into the graveyard itself, though it's immobilised by hand grenades from the infantry. Everyone is stumbling past each other in the darkness. Time is running out too. There are less than 10 minutes left now, the artillery is slowly running out of ammunition, and the Germans control La Chesnay and are denying me Granville. If the game ends now, I'll definitely lose. I've got two options I can pursue to try and claw something back. Hunt down and destroy the Stugs infesting Granville to sanitize that objective, somehow, and at the same time regain a foothold in La Chesnay to deny it to the enemy. The fight at La Chesnay is less demanding, though not easy by any means. It's been significantly boosted by the efforts of the Achilles over there. A few turns back it managed to spot the right hand Jagdpanther and knock it out with a flanking shot, though it was immobilized by a Stug immediately afterwards. Together with some more kills from the Churchills, I'm pretty confident that the anti-tank threat on the right has been significantly reduced. So I send the Churchills out to support a push by some of the surviving infantry on the other side of the road. They're in bad shape, so I want to give them as much backup as I can. The lead tank takes a spray of 20mm fire from an armoured car and knocks it out, but that unmasks it to a Stug sitting on the main road, which reciprocates. Following up unharmed, 
The second Churchill takes up position next to one of La Chesnay's barns to support the two surviving riflemen who manage to make it inside. The Churchill starts laying into scattered, fragmented German infantry up ahead, attracting the attention of a Stummel that takes a pot shot with its 75mm gun. Luckily, this misses, but the Churchill fails to make the spot. The Achilles, in line behind it back at the hedgerow, does spot the Stummel and gets a shot off, but this hits the Churchill in the rear and knocks it out. The blast, bringing the barn down to add insult to injury, killing the two men inside and destroying my foothold in the objective. As if that wasn't bad enough, by now the timer has run out and we're into overtime. I hurriedly scrape together some more infantry and the final Churchill of 10 troop, hurling them into La Chesnay to make sure it's denied to the Germans. The situation over in Granville is just as bad if not worse. There are at least two Stugs running around inside the objective and the infantry in the graveyard, the ones who had just close assaulted one Stug and knocked it out, are wiped out at point blank range from an assault gun with a 105. On the far left, meanwhile, I've moved the remaining Churchill and the Achilles out into the open to try and get something done. If the German tanks can swan about in the dark, I can too. Rolling straight into the infantry assault from the left, the Churchill spots and takes out a Stummel, then immediately spots the left hand Jagdpanther. It puts a partial pen in as it starts to rotate, but out wide the Achilles has got its back. One shot to the side and the Jagdpanther brews up. Pushing on, the Churchill all but rams a Stug by accident, tanking a HE shell aimed at some of my infantry. The Achilles spots it and takes it out in turn. Following up into the objective itself is less successful. The Churchill is somehow spotted by a Stug way back on the edge of the wheat field. One hit and it's out of action. The Stug is taken out in return by the third Achilles, which I've snuck up in the centre. The Achilles from the left, reorienting in support of the recently knocked out Churchill, makes the spot as well and misses, revealing it to the Stug in the middle of Granville, which promptly takes it out. By now, there doesn't seem much point in continuing on. We're five minutes into overtime, both sides are clearly exhausted, it's been a long time since I've seen any German infantry, and I certainly don't have the resources to go tank hunting to clear out the Stugs. So I hit the ceasefire button. The AI automatically accepts and the battle ends in a draw. Both sides have forces in both objectives so they are mutually denied and I've not got the bonus points for keeping my casualties down. It's a pretty chunky butcher's bill. I've lost 137 dead and 62 wounded plus 6 men taken prisoner, 6 tanks, 6 armoured vehicles, mostly carriers, and two other vehicles, a truck and a jeep, caught by a lucky mortar bomb. The Germans have suffered more. 239 dead and 115 wounded, with 10 tanks knocked out, I guess Stugs and Jagdpanthers count as tanks, and 15 other armoured vehicles, half tracks and armoured cars. It's total carnage out there. To what should be no one's surprise, it's the artillery that has racked up the body counts. My lone FO was responsible for 131 casualties in total. From the initial mortar stonk on the wheat field that looked like it caught a platoon out in the open, to the fire missions covering the objectives, there are a lot of German casualties scattered around the crate escapes. The FO also accounted for a total of 5 half tracks and 2 stugs, which is amusing looking at the stats. This is the same FO that called the fire mission in on the Panthers way back when we first arrived at Granville. The German FO, meanwhile, inflicted 41 casualties, mostly the elements of C Company I made the mistake of deploying right on top of La Chesnay at the start. This was a tough one. The darkness, of course, made it much harder, but a really telling factor were the tank losses the previous day. A few extra Churchills would have given me much better coverage and the numbers to absorb more losses and more mistakes. Again. One of the reasons this was difficult was because it was hard to pull off the combined arms the Brits need to shine. In this mission, it was the darkness. In other missions throughout the campaign, it was a lack of assets. In the World War II combat mission titles, more than any of the other main factions, the British will struggle without all the pieces of the puzzle. And while there were some frustrating design aspects to this campaign, that core element kept coming through time after time. 
There is another mission after this. I apparently qualified for the campaign's bonus mission. I'm not going to play that. I have something else up my sleeve for a bonus mission that I think will be a lot more interesting. So cease firing through that, we get to the end of the campaign. Across all 14 missions, I've lost 437 dead and 307 wounded, 9 missing, 14 tanks, 19 armoured vehicles and 2 other vehicles. Germans have lost 1135 dead, 628 wounded, 6 missing, a whopping 42 tanks and 38 armoured vehicles, plus a lone Kubelwagen or something. In the greater scheme of the war, this is an attritional win for the Allies. Historically, this reflects the results of Operation Epsom. The German forces defending and counter-attacking the Scottish Corridor suffered heavy losses that they could not afford in the long run. The operation did not achieve the territorial gains that Monty set for it, whether he always intended the battle to be part of a fixing attritional strategy targeting the Germans around Khan, or whether he retroactively declared it as such when it failed to gain ground, remains debatable. But it's over. Thank God. I hope you've all enjoyed joining me on this slog, and it has been a slog. If you have, make sure you look up Double Vision and Requin 87 tackling the campaign as well. I'll leave some links down below. It's always interesting watching how other people approach the same problems. I know I've enjoyed catching up with how they did after I finished each mission. So, just the bonus mission to go. If you want to see that early, it's probably up on the Patreon by now, where you can also request and vote for the weapon effects shorts if there's something you particularly want to see get blown up. Uh, whether you decide to sign up or not, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next video.